At the end of Serpent Isle, the Avatar had restored the balance of the multiverse and was left floating in the ethereal void, from which the Guardian snatched them, ending the game on a cliffhanger. In 1994, the world would get an answer to the question, where did the Avatar end up? In the form of Ultima 8, Pagan, one of the more controversial titles in the Ultima series. As the game begins, the Guardian taunts you as he draws you from the void, and vows to conquer not only Britannia, but also Earth, promising to parade you in front of the fallen lands when he's done, before unceremoniously dropping you into the sea next to the land he calls Pagan, where none have even heard of the name The Avatar. This leads to the only thing you could call character creation, where you input your chosen name and are immediately thrust into the game. As the Ultima series had gotten further, so has the character creation gotten simpler. Granted, it wasn't that much more involved in Ultima 7, where the only significant difference was that, in addition to a name, you also choose a portrait and, as an extension, the sex of your character. You wake up on the shores of the island you saw as you fell, where a fisherman called Devon has taken you after you got caught in his nets. He reveals to you some basic information about the beliefs of the new land you found yourself in and warns you that you are likely to face much violence during your time here, before pointing you towards the nearby docks, where some trouble is apparently brewing. Compared to the earlier games in the series, Ultima 8 is now played from a lower isometric perspective, where the entire world is in a… slight angle. While this perspective can be more familiar to the player, and shows many details that aren't as prominent in an almost top-down perspective, it also has its flaws, such as objects or characters being obscured by walls in some instances. Controlling the Avatar has not changed much since the last game, and you interact with the world almost exclusively with the mouse. To move, you point your cursor in a direction away from the Avatar, which changes the shape and size of the arrow pointer. This determines which direction and at which speed you will move. This time as you move, so does the screen, and the jerky position changes of Ultima 7 have been replaced with a smooth scrolling. Double-clicking an object or a character attempts to interact with them if the object is interactable. Unlike in Ultima 7, the game now also takes into account the distance between you and the interactable object, and you can only interact with objects if you are close enough to them. In Ultima 7, the only limitations to interacting with objects on the screen were if they were too far on the height axis, or if they were obscured by things like walls and doors. Dragging and dropping is once more used to move and pick up objects, and a vast amount of objects in the world are interactable in this way. This feature has been in some ways improved from the previous games. Moving an object now shows a transparent shape of the object you are moving, and the cursor changes shape depending on whether you can or cannot move the object to the position you are trying to move it into before you let go of the mouse button. This is so much more pleasant than how the similar feature worked in Ultima 7, as in that you could only know if you could move an object to a position after you let go of the mouse button, which also reset the position of the object forcing you to start the process of moving it from the beginning. Due to the game taking distance into account, if you try to move an object too far away from the avatar, the object is thrown instead of just moved into the place. The Avatar's inventory is also similar to the previous games, but improved. Interacting with containers opens a window that is stylized to look like the container you're interacting with, and you can freely move objects within those windows. That alone is not any different from the older system, but this time there's a massive improvement that fixes an annoyance I had with Ultima 7. When you close and reopen a container, all the objects are more or less where you left them, unlike in Ultima 7, where your backpacks and other containers could shift their contents, making it more difficult to find what you were looking for. Equipping the avatar is basically the same as it was in Serpent Isle. A large portion of the character attribute window is taken by the avatar's paper doll, and equipping and unequipping is done by dragging and dropping equipment to and from the paper doll. 
In the new engine, the audio presentation has been significantly improved. In most of the previous games, including those based on the Ultima 7 engine, most of the audio has been purely music, with some sound effects being done via the MIDI interface. In Ultima 8, though, the entire game has digitized sound effects. Just like in Underworld 2, you can now hear the Avatar's footsteps, which have a few variations depending on the surface you're moving on and your speed. There are many ambient sound effects such as clocks ticking, etc. The addition of more sound effects allows the world to feel just a little bit more alive than it would with just the background music, which is also amazing, and the Tenebrae theme has been stuck in my brain for years. As you approach the docks, you stumble upon several other world's inhabitants, and the game shows you another improved feature of the engine. In Serpent Isle, the game engine was used to show rudimentary in-game cutscenes, which was amazing, but in Ultima 8 the improvements to the system allow for more visually striking cutscenes. First off, the game now has more animations for the characters, allowing for more detailed visual storytelling. And the game takes control of the avatar more liberally to ensure that you're not in the way of the events depicted in the cutscene. This first cutscene also shows you more of the nature of the world you've been thrown into, as you witness an execution of a man accused of blasphemy, presided over by someone who's clearly a ruler. In a sense, this mirrors things you've seen in Ultima Underworld 2, where the worlds ruled over by the Guardian were not particularly pleasant, and the rule of the strong was favoured. Here in Pagan, this seems to be the case as well, and deeds deemed illegal or subversive are struck down with extreme prejudice. Perhaps, as in those worlds, there are pockets of resistance here as well. At the very least, this seems like a good thing to investigate. As you leave the docks past suspicious guards who seem very likely to abuse their position of power, you enter the city of Tenebrae, which highlights another change in the game engine. The world is no longer completely open. Ever since Ultima 6, the game worlds of the Ultima games have been practically completely open and seamless. Sometimes there was some trickery involved, such as entering a cave which teleports you to another section of the map, but the clear intent was to make the players feel like that was not happening, and you were just walking from one place to another. In Ultima 8, however, this is clearly not the case, and the world is split into different maps with a period of loading between them whenever you walk from one map to another. Personally, this isn't that big of a deal to me, but it does show some of the limitations of the new game engine. Exploring the city and getting to know some of the townspeople eventually leads you to the city library, which is a veritable source of important information including accounts of the history of the world of Pagan. Long ago, the world of Pagan was inhabited by a people called the Zealans, who worshipped deities that were embodiments of specific emotions. But one day, the Guardian appeared, warning the people of a great calamity that would engulf the world, and the people should pray to the entities called Titans, that are the only ones who could spare their world from this impending disaster. This split the Zealands into two factions, those who chose to uphold the old ways, and those who believed the Guardian's words were to be taken seriously, and only by following him would they be able to save the world. These people came to be known as the Pagan. The resulting schism caused a great war that lasted for an untold period of time, so long that none believed that an end to the conflict would ever come. Until, one day, a being called the Destroyer appeared, and as its name suggests, brought immense amounts of death and destruction with it, caring naught which side would suffer. All seemed lost, and the world seemed doomed to complete annihilation, until a miracle happened. The four titans of the elements rose up and attacked the Destroyer. 
Seas swelled, the winds roared and the earth shook violently, moving mountains, and the skies were filled with streaks of fire. The fight was long and brought with it a complete restructuring of the entire world, leaving only the island of Mogaelin intact. But in the end, the destroyer was gone, and the pagan swiftly dispatched the last remaining Zealands, finally putting an end to the conflict. Ever since the day of the destroyer's defeat, the sun has never risen again. But the Titans have been revered by all remaining inhabitants of Pagan, and their demands for followers and sacrifice are sacrosanct. As in this new world that only exists because the Titans willed it to be so, and life in Pagan is allowed at the whim of these powerful entities. Pacts were made with the Titans to benefit both the humans and the Titans. Each of the Titans were in one way or another persuaded to stop using the world as their playground, and to give some of their power to the human population in exchange for sacrifices and reverence. One of these Titans, Hydros, endowed only one bloodline with her power. The head of this bloodline is called the Tempest, and is appointed the ruler of the city of Tenebrae. Talking to the librarian will reveal even more information and push you forwards in your quest to leave this plane. He wants to help you and directs you towards Mithrin, a scholar who dabbles in magical arts and ancient knowledge, and has chosen to live outside of the city walls, since inside the walls rules a repressive government. And you have seen what happens to those who are not seen favorably by the Tempest. Following the librarian's directions, you end up in the first dungeon of the game, a cavern leading to the plateau from which you can find the mysterious scholar. Here you have to master one of, if not the most controversial new features of the game, namely jumping. The 2D Ultima games have included a height axis since Ultima 7, but unlike the Ultima Underworld 3D games, the ones made with a 2D engine did not include jumping. Now, in Ultima 8, that is included for better and for worse. The good part about adding jumping into the engine is the increased player maneuverability. Instead of having to stack objects to use them as ladders, the avatar can now jump in place and grab ledges to climb onto higher levels. Another improvement from the Ultima 7 engine is that the camera now centers on the avatar, even if you are on a higher axis than the ground level. In Ultima 7 this did not happen, but the camera was centered on where you would be on the ground level. For the most part, this offset was not really noticeable, but in the rare instances where there were higher buildings, you could see how the engine did not compensate for the height axis when it chose the camera position. How jumping works is that you turn the avatar and press the left and right mouse buttons together, which makes your avatar jump a specific distance in that direction. Combined with the tiny platforms and instant death pitfalls if you miss, this makes quite a large portion of the game an exercise in saving and loading. Thankfully, you do have a lot of slots to do that. The save and load menus can be found in the main menu, which is now stylized to take the form of a book, where each page serves a different function. As in Ultima 7, you have several slots to save in, and can give each file your own description. The curious part about this system is that restarting the game is also done via this menu, and the first save slot is reserved for the new game option. In updated versions of Ultima 8, jumping was made significantly easier, and this patched version is what you will get if you download the game from one of the digital distribution marketplaces, such as GOG. In those versions, the cursor can be used to aim your jumps, making the specific alignment of the avatar irrelevant, as you can just point and click on a platform to jump on it. This is a bit of a two-edged sword, since while this function does make the game much less of a chore to play, it also means that the platforming segments, which were clearly meant to be a part of the challenge, have now been stripped of practically all of that challenge. 
In my opinion, there's really no way to properly fix the jumping without completely redoing the maps in which you have to take advantage of the mechanic. The platforming segments would be much more pleasant if they had taken notes from the Ultima Underworld games. And instead of having a failed jump mean death, it could just drop you to an area where you have to backtrack a bit and try again. This is because death in the game is permanent, as you are in a strange land, and there is no in-game reason why you should be resurrected somewhere, as was the case in almost every single Ultima game before. So, to avoid having to replay large portions of the game upon death, it is up to the player to save often to have a continue point nearby. In these caverns you will also encounter combat, which has been completely redone from the ground up. And instead of the more tactic style combat of Ultima 3 to 6, or the more passive combat system of Ultima 7, Ultima 8 instead opts for a more action RPG style combat system. To enter combat, you press the combat mode button, which causes the avatar to draw their weapon. In this mode, a movement is slowed down and trying to move will take one short step in the chosen direction. Attacking is done by double-clicking the left mouse button. You can also block by pressing and holding the left mouse button. And there is a kick which can stun certain enemies for a moment, which is done by double-clicking the right mouse button. The game also has several combat-oriented items to use, which include things like Molotov cocktails, exploding gems, throwing darts, etc. Using these, though, is more difficult than in the previous games, as the combat is real-time, as it was in Ultima 7, but opening the inventory does not pause the game. This is where the static inventory comes in handy, as the player can prepare combat-oriented items into handy stacks in the root of their backpack for quick access in the heat of the battle. Obviously, this system was meant to give the player more of a feeling of being a part of the battle, which unfortunately didn't manage to be as interesting as they likely wanted the system to be, as most often you just end up spamming the basic attack or stunlock enemies by repeatedly kicking them, which ends up making the combat quite repetitive in the long run. As you leave the caverns, you find yourself on a plateau filled with wildlife and many new kinds of plants, including red mushrooms, which are one of the environmental hazards of Pagan, as they explode if you step on them. On the plateau, you also find a lonely house, from whence you find Mithrin, who acts as another source of this world's history, and has a theory about how to leave this plane of existence and enter another. Dimensional transport takes immense amounts of energy, and Mithran hypothesizes that the power of the Titans is preventing people from moving between different planes. To counteract their power, he suggests you should learn the elemental magics of Pagan. Magic and Pagan works very differently from the magic of Britannia. Britannian magic is not linked to any deities and works by manipulating the natural forces around you. But since in Pagan, the natural forces are controlled by the Titans, this style of magic does not work, and all magic is drawn from the power of the Titans. The first school of magic Mithrin suggests you learn is that of the Necromancers, whose power comes from the Titan of Earth, Lithos, also known as the Mountain King. The sacrifices demanded by Lithos involve the burial of the dead, which gives a new layer of subtext to the execution seen at the very beginning of the game. The world of Pagan seems extremely strict when it comes to obeying the tenets of the Titans, and even the followers of a specific Titan still understand the need to respect the wishes of the other Titans, as crossing them can mean total annihilation, not only of them, but of the entire world. Therefore, the pact with Lithos was not respected, as the body of the executed man was not given to him as required, but instead was cast into the domain of the Lurker. To learn more about the Necromancers, you must go to the most obvious place imaginable, the Tenebrae Graveyard, travelling to which can be made easier with the recall tool Mithrin also gives you. The recall item is, in effect, a fast travel token, which is used to instantly teleport to a previously unlocked recall platform. 
These platforms are located in several important locations across the game. And uh, to minimize the need to backtrack through the wilderness or the jumping puzzle filled dungeons, it would be wise to try and locate each of these platforms when you reach a new area. The path to the graveyard is littered with the living dead, as zombies and skeletons wander the outskirts of the city, preying on the lives of the living. This is also a place that became very familiar to me, as the constantly spawning easy enemies were good fodder to use for the new leveling up system of the game. Unlike any of the previous games, uh, Ultima 8 doesn't really have an experience system. There are no levels nor any training points to be used for skill improvement, but instead in their place is a system where your attributes increase as you use them. To gain dexterity and strength, which in turn increases things like maximum health and combat prowess, you just need to attack and eventually these attributes will raise. Casting spells, on the other hand, increases your intelligence, which increases your mana pool. This again is one of those parts of the game where the idea is not at all bad. And in fact, with some improvements, it could be an extremely engaging system. As shown by how the basic idea for this type of character advancement was used much more effectively in Ultima Online. Unfortunately, due to the lack of any actual skills in the game, there is little incentive to be thoughtful about leveling up, and even just grinding the attributes to their maximum levels doesn't necessarily take that long. Taking much of the joy of improving your character away after the initial ooh, this is interesting moment. Wading through the undead, you reach the necromancer's lair and find out more about their customs. The Order of the Necromancers has a head necromancer who apprentices younger hopefuls in the earthen arts. But the numbers of the Order have now dwindled, and only one apprentice remains. The current Tempest of Tenebrae has enacted a campaign of misinformation and fear, stoking distrust of the necromancers, significantly decreasing the prestige and power of the Order. Her desire for control has now gone one step further, and the ceremonial dagger of the necromancers has been taken into the palace, forcing the order to request her permission whenever they wish to perform their rituals, one of which is imminent. To learn the magic of the order, you must help the order regain their dagger, which allows the necromancers to perform the ritual of succession. As the current necromancer is reaching the end of her life, and the tradition of the order dictates that she be sacrificed to Lithos, transferring her power to the eldest apprentice, who will then take her place as the necromancer. The Tempest's desire for power does not end there, and you find out the helpful librarian Bentic has been executed, and the fisherman Devon who saved you has been imprisoned, pending another execution. As the Avatar of the Virtues, it's obviously not in your nature to let people be killed unjustly, so you decide to investigate the matter. From the Journal of Bentic you find the reason for these actions. The power of the Tempest is hereditary, and the power of the firstborn in each generation has the capacity to override the power of their younger siblings. This firstborn is crowned the Tempest. Bentic, an avid historian, had been doing inquiries into the Tempest bloodline and found discrepancies in the official history and reality. This led him to the realization that the current Tempest is not the firstborn, but instead the friendly fisherman Devon is the rightful heir to the throne. At the execution, you reveal this information to the people of Pagan, and a magical duel commences with Devon emerging victorious. Now, having a friend in the court, and being in the favor of the current necromancer, you become his apprentice and are sent on a spiritual pilgrimage into the catacombs to speak with the necromancers of the past. This also allows you to start learning the first new form of magic. Elemental magic of the earth is somewhat similar in function to Britannian magic. First, you need to learn the spells. And while you as the player can read them from the manual, this does not mean the avatar knows how to prepare these spells, requiring you to still find the recipe within the game first. You also don't have a spellbook of any kind within the game, so to keep track of the spells, using either a notebook or marking the manual is practically a requirement, unless you have a very good memory. Each of the spells requires specific reagents to cast, and most of these can be found by exploring the island. 
Once you have the appropriate reagents, they need to be placed inside a bag, after which you wave the necromancer's wand over it, causing the necromantic reagents to transform into a magical focus. Each spell has its own focus, and you can prepare as many of them in advance as you wish. Using the focus, cast the spell and expend some of your mana. This system of using Foki does mean that spell casting in combat suffers from the same issue as using items does, as the game does not pause when you open your inventory, requiring ample preparation from the player if they wish to use spells without putting themselves in danger. The pilgrimage of the necromancers takes you into the massive catacombs behind the graveyard, deep within which are the graves of the ancient necromancers whom you are tasked to learn from. It is filled with traps, crumbling floors and many other environmental hazards and a plethora of enemies. The dungeon tests not only your reflexes but also teaches you several new spells and expects you to use them to survive. In classic Ultima fashion, you can get softlock within the dungeon, as certain spells are required to proceed, and reagents within are limited, forcing the player to think before acting. Similarly to some portions of Serpent Isle, the game does tell you what to do, and gives you enough materials to proceed, so this segment does not feel unfair despite the potential of a dead end. Granted, in the patched version, the amount of reagents and other necessary consumables has been increased, making it even less likely you'll end up in a softlock. Reaching the end of your arduous trek, you end up head to head with the Titan Lithos, who clearly deems you beneath him, but mercifully allows you to serve him, thus bestowing a portion of his power to you via the necromantic arts. This obviously pleases the necromancer who orders you to embark on another pilgrimage into the depths of the catacombs to find the birthplace of the first necromancer. In this location, which in the patched version is actually clearly marked, unlike in the unpatched version, the disrepair of the catacombs becomes apparent, and a pathway deeper beneath the earth has appeared. Exploring this newly opened area leads you to long lost caverns, once more filled with traps and numerous puzzles. In this dungeon, the game really seems to want to show off a lot of the interactivity features of the engine. There are leather puzzles, physics puzzles and even one of the most common video game puzzles of all time, the Towers of Hanoi. At the end you reach an ancient temple which reveals even more about the true nature of the world of Pagan. This temple is devoted to the deities of the now extinct Zealand civilization, and they speak to you. With the speech pack installed, which as well is included in the digital distribution versions, they do it literally. The speech pack add-on adds voice acting to the Titans, taunts by the Guardian as he's assaulting Britannia, and uh, to other deities you will meet. And overall, the voice acting is pretty decent for a 90s video game. Especially the Zealand deities have sometimes gotten flack for being poorly voiced, and I understand why, even if I do disagree with the sentiment. Each of the Zealand deities is based on an emotion, love, anger and neutrality respectively, and their voice acting is meant to represent this as well. As such, the voice of love is soothing and slightly sultry, while the voice of anger is much more forceful. And finally, the most maligned of them all, the voice of neutrality, which is purposefully as emotionless as possible. Greetings, Avatar. We are aware of you and from where you come. We also know of what you seek. And we wish to help you. You must become your destiny. These deities also seem to know who you are, and are clearly not entirely pleased about the state of the world. After all, the rise of the Titans spelled out the downfall of the Zealand civilization, which has left these beings forgotten and trapped within this abandoned temple. Because of this, they want to help you in your quest, and point you towards a Blackrock object, which they tell will be useful in your quest to return to Britannia. The deities also suggest you should gain audience with the rest of the titans and gain the power of the five elements, four represented by each of the titans and the fifth element, Aether, which will allow you to not only stand by the titans as their equal, but as something more. 
At this point, one aspect of the game design philosophy should be clear. Ultima 8 is very linear, even more so than Serpent Isle was. While you can explore each area you find quite freely, the game locks you out of new areas until you've completed the main story segment of the previous area, either by withholding a key that opens a locked door to the next area, or by having the next area only be reachable by a spell you need to learn. I completely understand why this feature might not be that popular with everyone, especially considering the history of the series where most of the games were open world and relied mostly on the player finding all necessary information, often in a non-linear fashion. But, as I mentioned in the Serpent Isle review, I really don't mind this that much, as the lack of narrative freedom does allow for the game to have a more tightly knit storyline than it might have if the player could roam the world more openly. You have learned to channel the power of one titan and three more remain. As the only clues you have on leaving this plane of existence revolve around channeling the power of the titans, it seems an obvious line of investigation to continue. And as such, your goal is clear. To go to the other magical schools and learn their powers. The School of the Theurgist is located on a small isle connected to the rest of Pagan via a network of tunnels beneath the island. There you will learn not only of how the philosophy of each order that follows each titan can differ from each other, but also how different the magic systems of the game can be. The Theurgists are healers, and as such their philosophy respects this aspect of their order. Honesty and humility are held as the cornerstones of their order, and the quest to learn their abilities should not be clouded by selfish desires, but by a want to help others. The storyline on the Isle does reflect upon this aspect as well, as you meet a young student who wishes to fast track to the end of his studies to learn the power of resurrection, as the execution witnessed at the beginning of the game was that of his father's, and the student wishes that gaining the power of the titan Stratos would allow him to bring back his father. Unfortunately for him, this is not how things work, and as he tries to complete the final step of becoming a theurgist, a leap of faith into the dark abyss of the sea, he instead falls into the water to be devoured by the monsters that dwell within. You, as the Avatar, must follow the rules of the Order to learn their magic and gain audience with Stratus. You complete the Trials of the Order, which are rather simple in execution, and finally get to construct your magical foci, which act as a, the means to cast Theurgy spells. One of these trials has a chance of introducing the player to the addition of fall damage into the game engine. The magical foci are constructed from pure silver, which can be found from beneath the monastery, and can be crafted into the appropriate shapes by a professional blacksmith. After this, they must be imbued with the power of Stratus at the Theurgist's altar. This makes the Theurgist spellcasting system much easier than that of the Necromancers, which relies on a reagent system similar to earlier Ultima games, specifically those before Ultima 7, where you had to manually prepare spells with the reagents instead of just being able to cast them as long as you have the reagents ready. Whereas using Theurgy only requires you to have the activated focus in your inventory and enough mana to cast the spell, making you prepare the spells only once instead of for each cast. After passing all of your trials and constructing your foci, you are sent to take the leap of faith the young student failed to make. There you get to meet Stratus, who bestows upon you the final spell, the ability to jump really far. This part of the game is extremely segmented as each of the areas you have to visit are isolated and have very little connection to the other areas, as practically all quest relevant people and objects are located within these small enclaves of the magical orders. Why this is makes all the sense when you see the credits of the game, where specific people worked on specific parts of the game, thus clearly marking this kind of segmentation in the game design itself. For the next power, you meet the titan Hydros, who has spent centuries being trapped within a mostly dried out lake, dispensing her power to the bloodline of the Tempests in exchange for not being entirely dried out. This obviously displeases her, and she's more than willing to promise you the power of Tempestry in exchange for releasing her, which, after a short dungeon, you're able to do. 
She does not keep up her part of the promise though and instead proclaims that sparing your life is enough of a reward. Before declaring her goal of eradicating the entire bloodline of the Tempests as revenge for her imprisonment. Before directly threatening the first friendly face you saw on this land, Devon. Here is also the first extremely obvious part of cut content. As the threats of Hydros amount to absolutely nothing, and the only change her release inflicts is that Pagan is now pummeled by storms, ones which the Tempests used to be able to dissipate. And now just make the screen grey and foggy. Thankfully, Devon does not blame you for the situation, although he does expect you to be the only person capable of doing something about the storms before Pagan is flooded, guiding you towards the final order, the Sorcerers. The Enclave of the Sorcerers lies deep within the volcano that the island was formed around, and once more requires the usage of spells from the previously visited orders. Before you even get that far, one of the sorcerers warns you to be on your best behavior, as the nature of fire and its servants is volatile, and one wrong word can result in a very violent response. How this volatile nature presents itself is evident from the very first steps you take within the compound. As you are immediately thrust into the middle of a power struggle between hopeful sorcerers who wish to be in a position to become the next master of the order. You learn that the nature of fire spells demands each sorcerer to imbue their true name with the spells. This true name is given to you by Pyros, and it not only gives power to your spells, but can be used to undo you. This is what the current power struggle centers upon, as the two opponents wish to know the true name of the other, so they can be destroyed, and is one of the few actual choices you can make in the game. Whichever sorcerer you choose to assist will then take you as their apprentice, and begin teaching you the spell casting of the order. In a sense, sorcery is a combination of the two previous spellcasting systems. Once more, the spells have to be learned by reading books, but how to use them is moderately complex, partially due to the sorcerers having their own terminology for practically everything. To cast sorcery spells, you must have a focus that is imbued with the specific magic you wish to cast. But, unlike the Urgy, the focus is merely a receptacle for the power of the spell, and only holds a specific amount of charges before having to recharge it, with either the same or a different spell. Recharging a focus is where things get complicated, as this can only be done in specific locations where you can find a sorcerer's pentacle. Each spell has its own ritual that must be followed to successfully recharge a focus, and some spells can only be imbued into certain foci. This is where the similarities to necromancy come into play, as part of the ritual revolves around placing specific reagents to the correct points of the pentacle. You also need candles, both black and red, which need to be in correct amounts and in correct positions on the pentacle. Once the ritual has been correctly prepared, you can use the pentacle, which then imbues the focus placed at the center with a spell. I honestly kind of love this. Is it a clunky system? Well, yes, but sometimes I really love some complex clunkiness. And this kind of an involved ritual requiring you to learn about the terminology of the order and then perform a series of very specific steps I just find fun if it's done well. And in this case, it's mostly done well. Having learned the magical talents of the sorcerers, your chosen teacher sends you into the Obsidian Fortress, the home of their master, and the location of the final deadly trials that determine whether you are worthy of being a sorcerer's adept. In the fortress, you encounter an old acquaintance, Arcadian the Demon, who you bound into the Black Sword in the Forge of Virtue, and whose help was instrumental during your quest on Serpent Isle but he does not recognize you. Explaining that time works in mysterious ways, as you may have gathered during the other games in the Ultima series, you find out that this is a version of the demon who has yet to enter Britannia, and as such also has yet to meet you. 
This little meeting is another way for the series to tie its different iterations together, while also breaking down the nature of time within the Ultima universe even more than the series has already implicitly done. At the end of your trials, the Master Sorcerer tests you and appoints you as an Adept of the Order, immediately giving you your first task as one to help with the summoning of the Titan Pyros. Scenes such as this really show how far Lord British wanted to push boundaries within the American society of the time, as the game includes a lot of imagery that could be, from a certain point of view, deemed as satanic. In fact, in later release editions of the game, the iconic box art with the very prominent pentagram were changed to only include the flaming background. The summoning goes well, but does not provide the desired results, as the world of Pagan has been mostly destroyed for centuries, and the battle between the Destroyer and the Titans blackened the sun. The inhabitants of this world only know of this world, held together by the power of the Titans. The Master Sorcerer has decided to summon Pyrus for one purpose, to learn what the sun is, as it is only known in ancient legends, and the mere concept of it is so foreign to the inhabitants of this world. But Pyros does not take this lightly, as he sees himself as the only fire in this world, and takes offense to someone wanting to know about the ancient flame. The Master Sorcerer brings out an object he calls the Tongue of Flame, which immediately banishes Pyros back into his prison. Having learned the magics of the land, and of some strange objects used by these magical orders, you return to Mithrin for more information. He recognizes these objects you describe and guides you towards a book describing ancient history and the rise of the Titans. Or, in other words, the final major lore dump. This book explains to you not only what you need to do to leave this world, but confirms certain facts about the past which you likely have already suspected. The Guardian never showed himself to the pagans, but instead acted only as a disembodied voice, imploring them to create a black gate and channel their power into it. This allowed the Guardian to imbue the Titans of the Elements with grand power, while having the Blackrock act as a means to control these Titans. His final plan to subjugate this world required him to take another role, as the Destroyer, the description of which matches the Guardian exactly. He then allowed the Titans to wreak havoc, destroying almost the entire world, except those loyal to him after which he slowly taught the pagans how to control the titans, thus having people worship him without knowing that he was the means of their destruction, not of their salvation. Since each order has one part of the black gate as a totem, your only hope is to recover the pieces of the black gate, imbue them with the power of the titans, and put it back together again so you can travel through it. Unfortunately, by doing so, you will also doom Pagan into suffering inevitable destruction, as you would be removing the world of the powers that keep this wreck of a world alive. But returning to Britannia is more important. You may have to doom one world of that is already on its way to slow but sure destruction, but by doing so, you may save many more worlds from suffering the same fate. So you travel to each of the Orders, steal their Blackrock objects, and travel to the Ethereal Plane where you journey through the elemental planes of each Titan and trap them into their respective Blackrock fragments. Finally, you imbue your essence into the final piece of the Black Gate, linking Pagan and Britannia together, and step through. You pass through the Ethereal Void and reach Britannia, but it is too late. The skies are red and it is clear that the Guardian has already conquered another world. Ultima 8 is, as sad as it is, not finished. But it's also not as bad as you might think. There's so much good in the game that the negatives don't really bother me. Are many of the plotlines cut and incomplete? Yes, but the main plot itself is complete enough and coherent, even if we're lacking a lot of the world building within that plot, and as a result many of the details surrounding the story are relegated to books. 
Is the fighting system simplistic? Yes, but no more than the click fight and things happen of Ultima 7. You can still interact with almost everything in the world and the ability to jump and climb allows for more involved world exploration. Sure, stacking objects to climb things was an interesting feature in Ultima 7, but the ability to just use your hand to climb is in my opinion a much more fun feature. The game world itself is in many ways a subversion of traditional RPG tropes. Usually, chests are full of treasure and other goodies in RPGs, but in Ultima 8 this is not the case. Chests rarely contain anything useful and often are trapped and can result in a swift death. Instead, most useful items are just sitting on some table or altar or on a corpse. But this is just part of the world and even mentioned in an in-game book, The Adventurer's Guide. The themes of the game are, in my opinion, fantastic and a very good continuation for Ultima. We've had games where you learn how to be a good person, immediately followed by a game showing you how those teachings can be corrupted, followed by a game showing how many of the deeds you thought were good ended up causing great harm to a completely different civilization. Now you've come from preventing the Guardian from invading Britannia to accidentally destroying a world while saving another one and into Ultima 8, where you have to actively deceive the inhabitants of the world while knowing your actions are more than likely going to doom them all to a slow death. And it all makes sense, as the Guardian is constantly taunting you during his conquest of Britannia, reminding you that if you stay here and let pagans suffer an even slower death, you are choosing to doom even more worlds to suffer that exact fate. It is quite brilliant and yet another subversion of things you've learned before, which is exactly what I expect from Ultima. The worst part about Ultima 8 is not that it's bad, because in my opinion it's not. It's that it could have been even better with more time. There are multiple reasons for why Ultima 8 was released as it was, and as much as it would please me to just blame EA for it all, that would not be entirely true either. As Lord British has in many interviews said that Origin was never told to release early, nor was the threat of cancellation held over their heads, but he was instead shown market research and with data made to believe that releasing as soon as possible would be the best for the franchise. This he also mentions as one of the biggest mistakes during his career, but has often taken responsibility for it. So it's complicated, and I recommend listening to his interviews if you want to know more, as that alone could be a subject someone other than me could make a several hour documentary about. Even the fighting system, as simplistic as it is in the game, does show what they wanted to go for, and how it could have been revolutionary at the time had they had more time to work on it. After all, it is described as trying to be Diablo before Diablo, and you can clearly see why. It's just not as smooth as it should be, so it ends up just trying instead of succeeding. And the same applies to the story. There's so much backstory that is hinted at and would have likely been touched upon in the expansion had that not been cancelled. But as we never got the Lost Veil, vale, these teasers are unfulfilling and never got a resolution. In short, despite all its failings, I really do enjoy Ultima 8. The world of Pagan is intriguing and the story of the Avatar having to subvert the virtues he embodies to be able to save several worlds from certain destruction is quite fantastic. I just wish the game would have been properly finished, as I would have loved to see what the entire plan for the game had been. Now we only have the cut version, but since even that has so much brilliance behind it, the original plan would have likely been even better. But something having the potential to be even better does not mean what we got is garbage. At least, I don't think so. Anyway, that is it for this time. Thank you all for watching, and special thanks to the Kofi and Patreon supporters, Tama7, Zai, and Daniel Supke. And until next time, when we get to the finale of the Ultima series with Ultima 9. Fintrovert, signing out.